Good morning. I want to welcome you this morning. Hopefully you are ready to worship with us this morning. Uh, if you are visiting with us, if you wouldn't mind, in the pew in front of you, uh, you'll find a little card that says welcome. If you wouldn't mind just taking one of those out and then filling it out, and then on your way out, there's offering boxes at either door, and you can go ahead and drop, one of the, drop it in one of those boxes. We'd love to have a record of you being here with us this morning and worshiping together with us. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm 96, and I'm going to be reading the first eight verses. It says this, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day and declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among the, all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him, and strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name, and bring an offering, and come into his courts. Will you pray with me this morning? God, we come before you this morning as we prepare for this time of worship, and I pray that we would just be uh, opening our hearts here this morning to hear um, your words and your calling on our lives here this morning, Lord. Uh, whether it's through the time of worship or uh, through the message that you've prepared through Pastor Stephen this, this morning, Lord, I pray that you would just speak to us uh, here where we are this morning. I pray that you would just challenge us to uh, be more in line with your will and your ways so that we can give you the praise and the glory by the ways in which we live our lives here, uh, where you've placed us uh, both to do ministry, to live, to be with our families uh, here in Lawrence County, Lord. We think this morning of the many who are traveling, who are taking advantage now that school is over and uh, heading out on vacation, Lord, we pray that you would just be with them wherever they are, um, that they would be able to uh, have time spent with you this morning, whether it's watching the live stream or connecting uh, with another local church, wherever they find themselves this morning. Lord, we thank you for the ways in which you allow us to be a part of the global church and that we can meet uh, wherever we find ourselves if we are willing to go. And so we thank you for that. We pray now that you would just speak to us through this time and let us worship you here this morning, Lord. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, if you were listening to that piece of scripture that Pastor Brian just read, the very beginning of it said that we're to sing to the Lord. It said it at least three times. And you know, when the Bible says anything multiple times, that's important. Something we need to pay attention to. So let's start our service off with singing number 24, Oh, Worship the King. And let's sing unto the Lord this morning. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing. His wonderful love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. Oh, tell of His might, oh, sing of His grace, whose robe is the light whose canopy space his chariots of wrath the deep thunder clouds form and dark is his path on the wings of the storm frail children of dust and feeble as frail in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end. Our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. 
And one of the reasons that we worship him and we sing praises to him is because of the blessings that he gives us every day. Um, he is a fountain of blessings to us every day. Let's sing number 98, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, Sung by flaming tongues above, praise the fount I mixed upon it, fount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. And one thing that we've noticed as we look at the blessings that he gives us, at the life that he gives us, you know, there's just nothing like our Lord Jesus Christ. There's none like you. 109. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. Sing that over again. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. Your mercy flows like a river wide and healing comes from your hand. Suffering children are safe in your there is none like you. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you.
As we look at that there today, we know that one of the things that we need in this world is we need rest. And so even amongst the freedom that is uh, professed and proclaimed amongst those that uh, often uh, kind of reject the Word of God, the authority of the Word of God, they profess freedom. One of the things they lack, they lack rest. And I think that invitation that Jesus gives is still relevant to us today. Come unto me and I will give you rest. To be get ready to get in the Word of God before we get into there. Let me just take the opportunity just to say thank you. Um, thank you for your kindness and your well wishes, your condolences. Thank you uh, for your gifts. It was a blessing to see the flowers and the gifts uh, that were there at my father's funeral. It uh, was not completely unexpected. We knew that it was coming and we had, uh, had mentioned it in prayer before, but it was still uh, a loss there for our family and it's, it's still deeply felt there. So we would appreciate your prayers as you continue to pray for my uh, family. You pray particularly there for my mother uh, there as well. They were, I think, married 56 years uh, there. And so uh, there's a, a kind of a, a deep loss there and a deep hole uh, there. But we appreciate your prayers. We appreciate your condolences. As you're praying about that, um, my family is not the only family going through grief right now. I want you to uh, pray there for Marilyn Shively. Uh, she just lost a grandson this past week. And then you can pray for Barbara Ellison. Uh, Richard passed away this past week. His service 
Uh, visitation will be from 1 to 6 today at Day and Carter, and then tomorrow at 11 o'clock, uh, they will be having his funeral services there at Day and Carter there tomorrow as well. But be praying there for uh, Barbara Ellison and, and the Ellison family. And then this morning we learned that Pam, uh, or I guess yesterday, we learned that Pam Allhorn lost her father uh, yesterday. And so be praying there for Pam Allhorn and her family there as well. And so uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer together this morning. Lord, as we uh, come to you this morning, we often come there with the heaviness and the burdens of what we carry there throughout the week. We think of uh, these families in particular that were mentioned today that uh, have experienced loss and grief and the sadness that comes with that. But Lord, we ask that you would draw us to yourself and remind us of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ and the difference that he makes. And so, God, we are grateful there for that hope. And so, Lord, we lift these up to you today. We ask that you would come alongside of each of them for uh, my mom, and, and Lord, we also pray for uh, Marilyn and, and Barbara and Pam. Lord, we ask that you would just come alongside of them and comfort them. We pray that you would just be with their families, that you would just comfort them, that you would just give them the strength they need during this time, that you would just bless and watch over them. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege that it is of being placed in this church family uh, and the support and encouragement that we give there to each other. And Lord, we thank you for that this morning. Lord, we pray that you would... Uh, continue to be with us. We think of those that are away and that are traveling. We ask for their safe return, that you would bless and watch over them. And Lord, we also, as we think of this, uh, many that are uh, beginning to experience summer vacation as uh, the schools are let out, that Lord, that you would just protect and watch over, that you would bless them, that you would just help this to be a refreshing and relaxing summer uh, for our, our kids and for our teenagers and for our families. And that it'd also be a time of connection and uh, relationship as they would grow closer there together. And Lord, we just pray that you'd be with us now, that you would bless and watch over this time. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you would join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to be looking at several different scripture passages. And uh, if you have the bookmarks, you might want to, to bookmark several of these passages there this morning. We started uh, a couple weeks ago um, there on uh, kind of uh, Jesus, love, and gender is what we've been calling it there, I think. And uh, this morning, we wanted to take the opportunity to look and to ask that question, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? And so we'll be looking at that today. We, we address this because if it doesn't have to be very old to realize that we have been going through a dizzying pace of change, particularly as we're dealing with sexual morality uh, in the world in which we live. I am old enough to remember that uh, when some of the first television shows came out and how controversial it was. I, I, Will and Grace is the one that comes to mind. And, and the big controversy that they got in was the first homosexual kiss. And now we realize that almost every television show has the a homosexual couple or is trying to push the edge and push the envelope. And, and it's no longer pushing the edge and the envelope because it's accepted by the culture at large. Uh, but it, it is different from what it was. And so we've gone from that place where uh, society and culture at large would have rejected homosexuality, would have said that it was immoral. Now to we're at the place, if you do not agree that homosexuality is not only moral, but should be affirmed and celebrated, you are yourself immoral and worthy of being canceled or being invalidated uh, there. And so we've experienced this dizzying pace of change. And we realize that it's not just outside in the world that we experience that, but that is also within the church. We expect the unbelieving world, those who are without Christ, to uh, if they embrace what Scripture calls sin. We're not surprised by that. But the greater trouble to me is this, is that there are many professing Christians, and not just within liberal Christianity that has rejected the authority of Scripture, but even within those who would call themselves evangelical that are now affirming and accepting homosexuality, not uh, just as okay, but as something to be celebrated and as something that is morally correct. Uh, we mentioned this before. If you see a church today that says affirming and welcoming, uh, you know, every church should be affirming and welcoming, right? We ought to be welcoming to everybody that comes in the door. But what are they saying when they say affirming and welcoming? What they're saying is, is they accept homosexuality is morally acceptable and they've redefined the sexual morals uh, that have been given to us. And so I want to look at this a little bit today as we study this, where 
How did we get to where we are? And then what should our response be as we look at this? Uh, and so uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I want to start with the Word of God. We're, we're going to go, uh, then we'll look at where we, how do we got to where we are. We'll come back, we're going to study several different scripture passages. Uh, and then we'll kind of look at what our response should be there at the end as we look at this today. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, and it says this, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the uh, name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And so as we look at this, what we kind of want to look at as we begin to understand this is to ask the question first, uh, where are we today? And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I think it's helpful for us at least to understand this, uh, kind of where we are in, in the world at large of where we are today as we kind of deal and we talk about some of these issues and then uh, how we got to some of this place. And so one of the things I think it's helpful for us to understand is this, is that progressives today view sex or sex identity uh, not as something that we do, but as central to who we are. Uh, in the past, we would have viewed sex as something that we do, uh, but nowadays that's switched and has changed as to be who we are. And so, in particular, our sexual orientation or our sexual identity is not just a part of our identity, but is the central or the core of our identity. And so that kind of gets us a little bit confusing at times because we would look at that and to say, well, I can disagree with what you do, but you still care about you. But understand in the mind of those that advocate for this, you cannot disagree because who, what they do is who they are. Uh, and so to say to somebody who may be struggling with same-sex attraction that I believe that homosexuality is wrong, uh, but I you know, still care for you, does not compute to them. Because to say that homosexuality is wrong is then to disagree with the whole person of who they are and to reject the whole person of who they are. Because the sum of their identity, or at least the core of their identity, is kind of centered in their, into their sexual orientation. So it's not something that they do. We, we would... Uh, in particular, as we're arguing about sexual sin, we would say that sexual sin is something that we do, and by God's grace, we can experience change. They would not say that. They would say that that is who they are or central to who they are. So it's helpful to understand that. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that we're going to agree with that, but at least knowing that where people come from, uh, we can understand a little bit more as we're talking there with them. As we look at that, we got to this place because where we are today, personal feelings are validated and external objective truth is rejected. We see this not only as we're going to deal in particular today with the question of what does the Bible say about homosexuality, but we see a lot more of this uh, in the transgender movement. Uh, and we'll deal a little bit more about that with that next week. But the idea is this, is what a person feels about themselves is considered more important and is reality regardless of any other truth. Uh, and so if you disagree with that person, not only are you seen as unkind and bigoted, but it's also considered violence against that person, right? So words now uh, are considered violence, and, and uh, you are treating people with violence if you disagree with them. If you don't agree and fully validate what they feel about themselves, uh, you are not just rejecting them, and it's not just an idea to be discussed, uh, and it's the idea that, that uh, you are committing violence against them. And, and so we can see that this creates a problem, right? Not only does it create a problem for certain rights that we have held as Americans, that we uh, cherish and treasure, and have been considered as, uh, well, in the, the broader sense of what we would call liberal rights of, of freedom of speech and the freedom of religion or the freedom of worship, uh, we can see that uh, this idea of sexual orientation and gender identity is coming on a conclusion course together with those rights. If what a person feels is true, regardless of any objective truth. Uh, that means not only do they reject objective truth, such as uh, what their body reveals about who they are, but they also reject any outside authority. The only authority that they live their life by, and we hear this people today to say, well, you've got to live your truth, 
the only authority that they would live by is by their own feelings. What do I feel about themselves? You do what's pleasing to you. You live your truth. You, uh, and so they reject any outside authority. And so as we understand this, particularly for Christians, right, this then becomes a watershed issue. If you understand a, a watershed issue, if you go to the Rocky Mountains, you know there in the wa- Rocky Mountains is a watershed mountain. And on one side of the Rocky Mountains, if rain falls on one side, it flows there into the Pacific Ocean. If it flows, falls on the other side, it flows into the Atlantic. And, and where you are on that line determines where you'll end up. And so the authority of Scripture is that watershed issue. If we reject the authority of Scripture, we're going to end up in one place. If we accept the authority of Scripture, we're going to end up in another. And so the authority of Scripture, or external objective truth, is a watershed issue as we look at this. Thirdly, what we see is this, and this is, I think, helpful in particular to us as Christians, is that progressive theologians seek to confuse believers and lead them away. As we study the Word of God this morning, we're going to particularly look at that because this is uh, particularly important to us as Christians, right? As Christians, we profess to follow the authority of Scripture, and that Scripture informs our morality and our decisions, that Scripture is what we would understand are external, objective, moral guide. And so this kind of deforms, uh, informs us how, what we think about these certain subjects. Well, it really doesn't matter what we think about these particular subjects. The question is, what does the Word of God say about these issues? And so as we look at this uh, today, the issue or the way in which this is argued is that progressive theologians will muddy the issues, will confuse you, They'll say something like, well, that's not what the Scripture is teaching you, and so, and, and this is what it's supposed to be. And then, rather than leading you to an answer to the clarity of the truth, they'll leave you in that confusion, and then they'll try and insert uh, the issue of accepting or affirming homosexuality as accepting that it's normal. And, and they'll try and confuse you and distort the truth so that you will accept the behavior that they're trying to encourage you to accept. Um, and so we want you to be aware of this. This is the tactic that's being used. That They'll never answer the question. They'll never open up the scriptures and to say, well, I believe that homosexual marriage is okay because this is what God teaches. Um, the, the irony is, and I'll share just a little bit more about this in just a moment, but the irony is, is that it, uh, the authority of scripture in dealing particularly with homosexuality, they'll reject the authority of scripture there. And then when they want to get you to accept homosexuality, they'll go back into the... Hom- uh, Authority of Scripture is to say the Scripture says to love your neighbor. And, and I'm like, no, you don't get to reject the authority of Scripture over here and then affirm the authority of Scripture over here. If you reject it over here, you've rejected all of the authority of Scripture. You don't get to argue parts of it here and parts of it there. It doesn't work that way. You accept all of what Scripture teaches or you reject all of what Scripture teaches. Uh, you can just say it's an it's a informative moral guide, or you can say it's authoritative, but you don't get to hold both places. You can't ride the fence on this. Uh, and so as we look at this, uh, our position is the Word of God is the objective moral truth that guides our decisions. Uh, and so when our uh, lifestyle, our teachings, our uh, morality does not line up with Scripture, we're wrong and we need to change. That brings us to the third point, or the fourth point here is this, because the church holds to revealed authority and will not bend, we've become the object of attack. This is where we've got to where we are today, and this is why we say that uh, this new morality, this new sexual morality in particular, is in a conclusion, a, con- a collusion course together uh, with the freedom of religion, because the church holds to this objective authority. And because uh, we understand that God has established marriage, that God has established sexuality, and that God has the right to direct us how we should live, and because we're not bending to the winds of cultural change, right? We, we, we don't believe that we have the freedom, the authority to do that, that God is the one who sits in authority, and we arrange our lives under His authority, and we don't have that freedom to change we now have become the object of ridicule. By and large, in most places, and, and um, my kids were just warning me of this, this, I guess next month is Pride Month in the month of June. And so if you're on social media or any type of thing, one of the things you're going to see in this next month is everybody's going to have rainbows everywhere. Yes. Uh, and that's just their way of saying that they've accepted 
uh, homosexuality, they're showing their gay pride and all of that. And by and large, the culture at large has accepted and affirmed homosexuality and the transgender movement and all of the other of the alphabets of the LGBT, they've accepted and affirmed that as morally acceptable and okay. And the church is kind of in a lone island by itself as saying, no, God still calls these sin, and if God still calls these sin, we have to affirm and accept what God has, has revealed to us. And so because we're on that lone island by itself, we've now become the object of ridicule, the object of scorn, and if I were to look at this, and I'm not a prophet, but if I were to look at this and if history continues on the same course in which it continues, uh, it will also probably be the grounds by which persecution comes to the church in the United States. Uh, that, that we'll see churches being sued, uh, we'll see uh, licenses being revoked, we'll see property being stripped away because we refuse to accept and affirm uh, that what we will be called will be called hate speech, and uh, that will be the means or the grounds by which persecution will often come here to the United States. And, and so this is where we are. So we want to come back, and the question that we have today is, uh, what does the Bible teach about homosexuality? Because that, as we've looked at that, if we accept the authority of Scripture that God is the one who has created genders, male and female, if he's created marriage, God... Uh, brought Adam and Eve together, and, and out of those two made one, and we accept that God establishes these boundaries. He's given to us the guidelines of how we should accept and enjoy uh, sexuality there within that boundary of marriage, uh, and we accept God's morality, then we need to ask the question, what does God say then about homosexuality in particular as we're dealing with this issue that's on the table today? We've looked at this, and we've said that progressive theologians attempt to muddy the issue. They'll try and basically say, well, the Scripture doesn't really teach that, that being that homosexuality is sin, and that what you understand is wrong, and then they'll try and get us to accept that God now accepts and affirms homosexuality as a loving, committed relationship, and God accepts and affirms homosexual marriage. The problem is, is... As we deal in particular, for example, with the question of homosexual marriage, I don't have to answer the question whether I accept, I accept uh, or affirm homosexual marriage if homosexuality, the act of homosexuality itself, is sinful, then it, ergo it flows that homosexual marriage is then not acceptable to God. Uh, and so we want to understand what does the Scripture say. And so just to say this, sometimes I, uh, as we look at this, we study this, we... I want to make sure that we get it correct. And so I, I didn't want to say something about uh, progressives and progressive theologians that um, I did not necessarily know. And so before, as why I was studying for this message, I did a little bit of research. And I went to one of the premier uh, homosexual rights advocate group, the uh, Human Rights Campaign. And if you'll know that, you'll know that they're uh, a main advocate group for there. And interestingly, on their website was an article that said... What does the Bible teach about homosexuality? And so I thought, well, this is just right what I wanted to do. And so as I looked at that, as we looked at this, it addressed these issues, these scripture passages in particular that we're going to look at today. It addressed these and said, this is why it doesn't teach what it teaches. And uh, very simply, I, I think it's this. You don't have to take my word for this this morning. I believe this, that our God is an intelligent God that knows how to communicate in a way that we can understand. And he's done so in the Word of God. So if you have a, a copy of the Word of God that is accurately translated and preserved for us today, which is almost what all of you have, Amen. you can clearly understand this yourself. You don't need me up here telling you what you can understand very clearly with the Word of God. And in particular, if you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you who will guide you into all truth. Uh, and so I'm just going to point some things out to you this morning. Um, if you say, well, I'm just, I'm not sure about that, that's okay, don't take my word for it. You open up the Word of God, and you let the Word of God speak to you yourself. And I believe that you can study and understand this yourself. So we're going to ask this. As we look at this, I've got four main passages that deal with homosexuality. There's more than that in Scripture, uh, but we're going to look at these four main passages because they're kind of the, the key passages that, that give us the clearest teaching in uh, 
kind of the, they're in the context of homosexuality. Passage number one, right? What does the Bible teach us? And so what we're going to do, just to help you understand this, is we're going to answer some of the objections. Um, if you were to look on social media, on television, uh, because the church is the object of the attack, that's in particular, they're trying to kind of uh, bring these confusion uh, and these questions here, and they're going to give you these attacks. And they're going to do that without kind of giving you what does the Word of God really say. We're going to take the opportunity to kind of just show you what some of the objections are, and then we're going to say, what does the Scripture clearly teach as we look at this? So first place, if you have your Bibles, Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19, this, and I'll just put a very kind of a summary statement there. Uh, Genesis chapter 19, and and in the second passage you have there is Judges chapter 19, because if you look at those two passages, you'll notice they're they're two different accounts of two different stories that are very close and very similar. We're going to deal particularly with the Judges chapter, or sorry, the Genesis chapter 19 passage. Uh, There in verse 5, and so let me just give you a little bit of summary of what's taken place in Genesis 18 and 19. Um, the sin, or uh, Abraham has left Ur the Chaldees, has brought with him his cousin Lot. They uh, had kind of resources that were too great to be supported by the land, so they parted ways. And uh, Lot went down and he chose uh, their Sodom and Gomorrah as his place because the plains were well watered and it was good for crops. And it ends up being that Lot ends up moving into the city of Sodom. Uh, then in Genesis chapter 18, God in his mercy comes to Abraham and, and reveals to Abraham Jesus Christ or the, the theophany there of Jesus Christ and two angels come to Abraham and reveal to Abraham, I'm going to destroy the city of Lot. And we know this, that Abraham intercedes or pleads on behalf of the city of Lot, or, sorry, the city of Sodom, on behalf of the city of Sodom because of his cousin Lot. And he gets it down that there's like 10 righteous people in the city, all spare the city. And so uh, the Lord leaves, the two angels go down uh, there to Sodom to warn Lot and his family. And at that time, it was Lot and his wife and his two daughters, his other daughters had married. Uh, and they warned them of that coming attack. And so the two angels come and they're outside on the city square when Lot sees them and says, it's not safe for you to remain out here come into my house as guests. And so they come into their house as guests um, when there that night, the men of the city knock on Lot's door and says, Lot, we know you've got two guests that are with you. Bring them outside. And if you've got the old King James English, it would say so that we may know them. And and we know that's just a very polite way of saying so that we may have sex with them. Um, The tragedy of the story, if you know the story, there's this, is that Lot seeking to protect the safety of these two men, offers his two daughters. Uh, They've not known anybody. You can take them, do whatever you want with them. And if it were not for the mercy and the grace of God, and the two angels shut the door and blind the men, uh, we don't know what would have happened. But God in his mercy preserved and protected them. And so we come there to Genesis chapter 19, verse 5, right? And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out that we may know them carnally. Um, And so the objection is, well, it wasn't really the homosexuality that God was judging. It was the sexual violence and the lack of hospitality in an Eastern culture. Um, The problem is the clear reading of the story reveals that the homosexuality was not just that it was homosexuality, but homosexuality was so accepted within society that even rape was tolerated. Uh, It wasn't that Lot could have said to the men of the city, look, you guys better knock it off or I'm going to go get the police, because the police were probably out there accepting and affirming what was taking place, and there was nobody there to protect it because it had been so accepted at society at large. One of the things we understand when we study Scripture is we interpret and study Scripture with Scripture. We compare Scripture with Scripture to understand it. So if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Jude. The book of Jude is a one-chapter book right before Revelation. So all the way in the back there in the book of Jude, we have this one chapter. And so this reveals, it gives us more additional insight to what's taking place. Jude chapter verses 4 through 7. We're going to just look at verse 7 today for the sake of time, right? 
And it's talking of the judgment or the destruction that's coming. And as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, uh, flesh and set an example of suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. It reveals to us that God sent his judgment because of their sexual immorality. And when we compare that and we read that to Genesis chapter 19, we understand that to be homosexuality. Um, matter of fact, it's so clear to us that we understand this, right? That a, another name for homosexuality is sodomy. And that was taken here from the city of Sodom. The, that city of Sodom is the name. It so characterized the city of Sodom that it lent its name to homosexuality. So the very clear teaching of Scripture as we look at Genesis chapter 19 would be that Sodom was destroyed because of their acceptance of homosexuality. The, the predominant sin, not the only sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, but the predominant sin, the, the places we would look at this, that uh, moral degeneration had so occurred that homosexuality was so well accepted within the city that it was no longer viewed as wrong, that it was accepted by and large by the culture of the society in that city at large. And it led to the judgment of God there in the city of Sodom. Homosexuality is sin, as pointed out by Genesis chapter 19. Passage number 2. Passage number 2 is Leviticus chapter 18 and 20. Uh, Leviticus chapter 18 reveals the moral standard. Leviticus chapter 20 would be the sentence if somebody was found guilty of the crime. And so uh, Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22 uh, very, again, very clearly states, right? You shall not lie with the male as with the woman. It is an abomination. And I, I think most of us can probably understand the grasp of the English language well, language well enough to understand this referring there to the act of homosexuality. Uh, it is continued there in verse chapter 20, which gives us the condemnation or the... <coughs> if someone was found guilty of homosexuality... Here was the sentence that was to be carried out. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood be upon them. And again, the, the objection, as we've looked at these, to answer some of the objections, there's kind of two objections that are given. One is this, is this is an outdated moral standard given to a society that was concerned about uh, producing families or children, so making sure that they had a family lineage, and a distinctiveness as a nation. And, and <clears throat> part of the distinctiveness as a nation is correct, right? They, they had a moral distinctiveness. They were called by God as to be heralds of his salvation. And they were called to live morally and righteously as contrasted with the Canaanite nations of whom God displaced out of the land. Uh, and so that part is, is correct. But the idea of it is just concerned with a, a family lineage, that, that this moral conduct was only concerned about a family lineage, uh, isn't correct. And if we were to look at that, uh, and you were to look at Genesis or Leviticus 18, Leviticus 19, you understand there's several other sexual ethics or moral ethics that are in there as well. The second objection is this, is ah, we're New Testament people. We don't follow the Old Testament. Like, we don't follow the Old Testament clothing laws about mixed clothing. You probably have on today mixed clothing. And so what's the understanding? How do we understand or answer that objection? Well, we understand that objection by understanding that, yes, Leviticus does contain both the moral law and the ceremonial law. The ceremonial law was given to the nation of Israel as how they were to live or how they were to express that distinctiveness. We don't follow the ceremonial law today because we understand in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. That, that uh, because he's fulfilled the law, we don't follow that. But what we also understand is that the law is for us today in that it reveals both the righteousness of God. How does the righteousness of God look, at, look like when it's lived out on a daily basis? Well, the Old Testament law, the moral law, reveals that to us. And it reveals how we are to live righteously. And so... Uh, we don't keep that law for our salvation. Jesus Christ has fulfilled that for us. We're there under grace. None of us could keep the law. Uh, and yet, when we want to say, how do we live a life that is pleasing to God? We look at the moral law. The moral law sets the standard. If we were to reject the, this moral law on the basis of that, then it would also mean then that we accept uh, incest, that we would accept bestiality, 
All of those would be now morally acceptable because we are far more enlightened people today than what they were back then. That clearly is not the case. Those are moral things. Uh, hopefully, any moral person today would have a moral objection to incest and say that is repugnant, it's repulsive. And yet it's also what the Scripture says, that it was detestable or that it's an abomination when referring there to homosexuality. Sometimes the objection is used to this, well, they just don't have a concept of sexual orientation like we have today. And to that we say, hogwash. Read your Bible, right? The, 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 like the Canaanite religions, you shall not do like the Canaanites did of whom were put out of the land. Uh, homosexuality is not something that's new to us today. Our understanding of it is not something that's new. Homosexuality has been around since mankind has been around. And the Canaanite nations had accepted it as morally acceptable and was a part of their daily practice. And God said it's because of some of these sins, as well as other sins, that they're being put out of the land. Don't be like those people. They understood about sexual orientation. Leviticus chapter 18 and 20 reveal to us that it's clearly a sin. Uh, matter of fact, it goes on to say that it is detestable or an abomination. Amen. That there's uh, uh, it, sin is sin, right? As we'll look at this, we'll understand this a little bit more. Uh, but there's something about it when we begin to accept that as morally acceptable as okay, it begins to show a degeneration that has come into our society and into our thinking. Number three is Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, again, clearly teaches us there about homosexuality. Matter of fact, Romans chapter 1, 26 and 27 is unique in that it teaches us both about lesbianism and homosexuality. Uh, just uh, you're aware of those terms, lesbianism is the homosexual, the same-sex attraction between women, uh, and in generally, uh, homosexual is referring to the same-sex attraction between men. Uh, in uh, Romans chapter 1, there uh, begins to say there in verse uh, 26, right, or for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for that which is against nature. We do understand that to be lesbianism. And in verse 27, likewise the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust to one another with men, committing what is shameful, receiving in themselves the penalty which is due their error. The objection of it is not that it's homosexuality itself that is wrong, but it's lustful, selfish behavior. Isn't all sin lustful, selfish behavior? Right? We choose sin because we choose to do what is pleasing to ourselves rather than is pleasing to God. And it doesn't matter what that sin is. It, it could be uh, stealing. You know, when we were a kid, we saw that candy bar and it wasn't ours, but we chose to steal it because we lusted after that. We desired it. It was selfish. We wanted it regardless of what it cost somebody else. And so we stole it. All sin at its base is lustful, selfish behavior. Uh, but particular so sexual sin, whether we're talking about fornication, whether we're talking about adultery, I'm doing what is pleasing to me regardless of who it hurts or what it's against. So it's not just lustful, selfish behavior or sexual exploitation because some would say it's about sexual exploitation. It was common in Roman society for older men to have young boys and to maintain them as slaves and as sexual slaves, and it was against that. Again, what is the clear teaching of Scripture? You can read it again, verses 26 and 27. What is the clear teaching of Scripture? It's more than just sexual exploitation. It's the homosexuality itself. It, it talks about them being burned with lust, right? there, in verse 27, leaving the natural use, burned with lust for one another. Uh, and so it would, again, be what we'd understand today is that is the sexual orientation. Uh, homosexuality is common in the Greek and Roman world. Uh, sometimes today the people will say, well, you know, you need to change what you believe about same-sex attraction and same-sex marriage because you are on the wrong side of history. As if history is some great moral judge. Uh, if you've studied history long enough to know, history doesn't judge anything. No. History would reveal to us, and I, I was astounded by this, I, I knew that uh, Nero, right, uh, Nero engaged in homosexual marriage. 
Uh, Nero had a young boy by the name of Sporus, whom he castrated and then married. And the young boy was the female partner and he was the male partner. Later, Nero would divorce him to have another sexual partner to which Nero was the female partner. And he would... So uh, homosexuality was nothing new in the Greek and the Roman world. All the great Greek moral philosophers never spoke out against homosexuality. They accepted it as acceptable in their world. Matter of fact, it was astounding to me when I found this, that uh, 14 of the 15 Roman emperors were either homosexual or bisexual. I, I didn't realize that until just recently as I was studying this. So what it would tell you is this, is that uh, historically, homosexuality was affirmed and accepted by the Greek and the Roman culture. It was morally acceptable. There was nothing seen as wrong with it. Even though some engaged in sexual exploitation, not all did, they would have what we would call today loving, affirming relationships. And yet Scripture calls it sin. Now, one of the, the criticisms that sometimes happen is, is that oftentimes uh, you think that homosexuality is the only sin. Well, you haven't read Romans chapter 1 or 2 then, right? Romans chapter 1 reveals that homosexuality is not the only sin, or in particular any sin that condemns us to hell. All sin condemns us to hell. Continue on there in that same passage there, right? In verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, strife, deceit, evil mindedness, they are whispers. It reveals to us these are all sins. As a matter of fact, the point of Romans chapter 1 verse Romans chapter 2 is to condemn every person guilty of sin. It goes on to talk about the moral person in Romans chapter 2, the first part of Romans chapter 2, uh, how the moral person is guilty before God and is a sinner before God. And if you continue on in Romans chapter 2, it talks about the religious person, that the religious person with their moral religious standard, even having the truth of God, doesn't live up to that truth that's been revealed. The whole point is to bring us to Romans chapter 4, that salvation is by grace through faith, and that salvation is available for all sinners. And in case you're wondering, does every one of us sitting in, in these pews today or standing on this stage? We're all sinners there. And so that brings us to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I want to come to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And there's a reason that I ended with 1 Corinthians chapter 6, this part at least, because I, uh, it's where we started off this morning. And it, it's in particular is where we're, we're going to kind of go from there and launch into the next part of the week. Quickly, we'll look and answer the question, how do we, where do you go from here? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 is very clear, right? Uh, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? The unrighteous are what God reveals to us as sin. This is sinful behavior. Every one of us are sinners, and because of our sin, we cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And then it lists out, and this is not an exhaustive list, right? This is not an exhaustive list, but it lists out some of those sins uh, that... Reveal that we're sinners and condemn us before God. Of two of which are the last part of verse 9, uh, nor homosexuals nor sodomites. Now, if you have a, a word for word translation, you notice you've got both of those. If you have a more of a thought for thought translation, it would have something about homosexual behavior. It's, it's clearly revealed there in Scripture. So, what is the difference here? Uh, the objection is this is that this is referring again to that exploitive sexual relationship. Uh, and the idolatry and, and excessive self-centered lust that was a part of this. And we talk about some of that excessive, uh, that exploitive uh, relationship, that, that some of it was uh, in the ancient idolatrous practices. You look at the, the passages of homosexuality in 1 Kings and 2 Kings. Uh, homosexuality was often involved in idol worship. And there was homosexual male prostitutes. If you study Corinth, you understand that, that it was a moral cesspool and that part of worship was immorality that was committed with temple prostitutes. And so part of that was homosexual prostitutes. It wasn't just uh, heterosexual prostitutes. It was also homosexual prostitutes. But it's more than that because as we look at this passage, it reveals two words here. And I, I'm just going to give you a little bit of the Greek simply because uh, they will use this to confuse you, to muddy the waters, and then to, to try and convince you that God accepts and affirms same-sex attraction and same-sex relationships. Uh, the word there, uh, starting there in verse 9 there, right? Uh, the homosexual uh, is that of the effeminate. It comes from the Greek word the malakoi. Uh, it is the passive participant 
or typically what we consider more of the female role uh, in that same-sex relationship. Uh, it was often looked at then as the male prostitute, uh, those who would uh, kind of present themselves with the more feminine side. The second word for the sodomite, there's our senecatoi, which is the active participant. And, and so the general term for homosexual uh, or the more male role. We see that again repeated in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, which only saying that to reveal both partners in that homosexual relationship are being condemned. It's not just the exploiter, but uh, the person who allows themselves. And, and we're not talking about rape and we're not talking about abuse. Those are completely different categories that that person is an unwilling participant. These people here are willing participants that have allowed themselves to be uh, used and exploited in that term because they're an active participant in it there. Uh, it talks about the different roles. And so both there are condemned as sin within Scripture. Just to clearly reveal to us that all homosexual activity is clearly defined as sinful and exclusionary from the kingdom of God. Right? None of these righteous. Now, again, we say that, that this, it's not... One particular sin that is the most condemning of sins, because it also talks about fornicators, about idolaters, adulterers, uh, thieves, covetous. Uh, it's one sin of many that condemns us. But the reason that we like 1 Corinthians chapter 9, because I want to bring you down to verse 11. All right? Here's the good news. Because, again, uh, homosexuality, same-sex attraction may not be your besetting sin. It may not be something that you struggle with. You may look at that and say, ah, oh, it's just, I don't understand it. That's just disgusting. Uh, but for the person who is, or maybe you have a loved one or a family member who struggles with it, I want to encourage you that there's hope today. There's hope found in Jesus Christ. Because it goes on to say there in verse 11, And of such were some of you. But you were washed, yes. you were sanctified, Amen. you were justified by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God. God offers hope and salvation from sin. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And all of us were unrighteous before Jesus Christ came. But it was only through Jesus Christ and his imputed righteousness where we experience the forgiveness of sin and the hope that he freely offers that all of us have experienced salvation. And so maybe you don't struggle with same-sex attraction, but you still need the salvation that Jesus Christ offers. And for the person who does struggle with same-sex attraction, they need the salvation that Jesus Christ offers. And so it brings us here to the third question uh, that I want to share with you today, and I'll try and quickly hit this. Uh, Jason warned me today that just because I've been gone for two weeks doesn't mean I get to go for a really long time. <laughs> what he didn't know is I have a whole bunch of notes that I'm trying to get through quickly here. The question is, how should I respond? We address this as we, we mentioned at the beginning of this because um, you probably work with somebody who is same-sex attracted. You may have a family member or a friend or a neighbor who is same-sex attracted. And, and you probably, um, they're really nice people. I mean, you get to talk with them and they're wonderful people to talk to. And then you begin to wrestle with the question is, is what they struggle with, their attraction that they struggle with, and the behavior that flows from that, is that simple? I mean, like, I, I know them, they're nice people. Can what they be doing is wrong? And so hopefully by now where we've come to this point, you clearly understand what the Scripture teaches. And the clear, Scripture clearly teaches that, yes, homosexual behavior is wrong or is sinful. But I also want you to understand, how do we respond then with that? There's, there's two passages that you just may want to look at these passages a little bit later. One is Luke chapter 15, is the story of the prodigal son, right? And the story of the prodigal son reveals to us, as we look at that story, that God, in his grace, gives us a choice. He will not force us to accept his morality or his righteousness. He gives us a freedom and a choice. And so this morning, you have the freedom and the choice. Uh, having heard all of what we've presented, you have the freedom and the choice to say, I don't believe that, I don't accept that. I'm going to pursue what is pleasing to me regardless. And God in his grace has given you that freedom. Um, if you remember there in the story of the prodigal son, the, the younger son took the father's goods and left. The father never stopped him. He never said, look, I'm going to take all my goods back. You can leave, but you're leaving poor, destitute. No, he allowed him to go. Uh, 
And yet, what did he do? The father waited day after day, night after night, on the porch, waiting for the son to return. And that's the position there of God, that God longs for and wants sinners to be restored to him. And so you can choose to accept what God's given to you, and you can choose to walk away from God. God's given you that freedom to do that. But understand this, that God, in his grace and mercy, desires you to be restored and to come back to him and has made everything available for you to do that. If you want to do that, then stick with me for the next few moments. One of the things that we need to understand as we talk about the sin of homosexuality is this, that the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality. It doesn't do us any good to say we're going to get a whole big, great big bunch of Playboy magazines, we're going to shove them in front of this homosexual, attractive, the same-sex attractive person, and at the end of that, you know, that's still sin. Yes. And exchanging one sin for another sin doesn't help the person. The opposite of homosexuality is holiness. That God is calling that same-sex attracted person into a life of holiness. As we look at Romans chapter 1, verse 28, we see this, that homosexuality is a sin condemned by God, but it is not the only sin condemned by God, nor is it an exclusionary sin uh, that uniquely sends a person to hell. God is angry with all sin, and all sin puts us under the wrath and the judgment of God. That brings us to the unique point that we have that opportunity to point all people towards Jesus. And what Jesus desires from all people is holiness. So whether you're a same-sex attracted person or whether you're a heterosexual attracted person, uh, God desires holiness in your sexuality. That you're to live a holy and a righteous lifestyle for God. So for some, God may, in their grace, in His grace, give them the opportunity to come out of a same-sex attraction, a same-sex relationship, and they may find fulfillment in a, a heterosexual marriage. And God may bless them and give them that grace that they can experience that change. For others, it may mean that they live a life of singleness and celibacy, honoring God with their celibacy, choosing to live a life of holiness rather than a life of self-indulgence. The opposite of homosexuality is holiness. Secondly, uh, we need to separate the issue from the person. Now, I want you to understand this. This is hard because right, we differ from the world. The world cannot separate the issue from the person. So uh, sometimes you've heard of say this, right? We, we love the sinner and not the sin. Well, we've already established as we look at the world and society today, the sinner is their sin. You can't separate the two in their mind. We're not part of the world. We separate. So that means that we have the opportunity to firmly hold to the truth, to lovingly disagree and not change the word of God, and yet still maintain a relationship with the individual that struggles with same-sex attraction. We can love that individual and affirm them as an individual and who they are, understanding that their sexuality is not the totality of who they are. They are far more than just what their sexuality or their sexual attraction is. And we can love and care for a person uh, there without that, still holding the word of God. We don't have to compromise the word of God as to say, well, I, either I have to love them and compromise the word of God and affirm and accept their lifestyle, or I've got to reject the person. No, don't fall into that trap. That's a trap of Satan that wants you to can, uh, compromise the word of God. I can love this individual, and I can still hold to the word of God. Now, that means, even as I do so, they may not necessarily receive my love. We sometimes illustrate this, that sometimes the most loving thing that we can do is to help to warn people of the danger ahead. And so uh, we seek the best for that person. So uh, that brings us here to this, right? Number th three is this. We need to see that the person is more than the struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, understand this. The same-sex attracted person, whether uh, they're a homosexual rights activist or whether they're just uh, they're confused and they don't know the truth, that same-sex attracted person is made in the image of God. Genesis chapter 1 reveals to us that we're made in the image of God, that we are image bearers of God, that we are created in His image. That means that we are given special dignity and worth by God. Sin mars that image. But I still want you to understand and realize that even a person that struggles with sin, if that sin is same-sex attraction, uh, 
they still carry the image of God. And that means that we are to affirm their dignity and worth as a person and an individual, an individual who is loved and cared for by God. That does not mean that we affirm their sin or their behavior. That we understand that that same-sex behavior, homosexual behavior, is sinful and is against the authority of God, but that God cares for that person and His love is available there to that person. We treat them with dignity and respect. And so that means I, I don't believe, and I, I think this is sometimes is hard for us, especially if we don't understand same-sex attraction, that we don't use this as a derogatory way, as a term to tear people down, uh, as to make fun of. Uh, there is never an acceptable time to bully someone or to beat someone up. This is never an accepted time to verbally abuse someone because of their... Uh, choices in the behavior, we have to realize that we need to affirm the image of God in that person. We also understand this, right? To be tempted is not sin. Uh, Because we're tempted with something doesn't mean that it's sinful. If we indulge that temptation, if we fantasize about that temptation, or if we act on that temptation, that becomes sinful. Luther put it this way, Martin Luther, the great reformer, he says it this way, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head but you can't stop them from making a nest. We don't have to act on the temptation even if we experience. Love seeks the best for the person. We've talked about this as we began this series, that we, we, we affirm what we call human flourishing. We understand that human flourishing occurs that when we arrange our life under God's plan for us and that His plan is best for us and that we do the best when we arrange our life under His. And so when we share people, this is what God's plan is. This is what Scripture clearly teaches. What we desire is the best for them. They may not see it that way. That's okay. Um, We seek God's approval more than we seek men's approval. We still want to love them as God loves them. Um, But sometimes we understand this, right? Uh, We use the illustration of the the bridge being out, right? If you were traveling on a dark road, and maybe this past week you had the opportunity, maybe on Thursday night, you were traveling on a dark road uh, there on your way to work, and you come across this road that has a small, narrow bridge, and because of the rains that happened on Thursday night, that bridge is washed out. Now, the most loving thing that you can do is to say, realizing the bridge is washed out, is to back your car up a couple hundred yards down the back of the road and to put your car in the middle of the road and to stop people from coming. But let's say you've got a neighbor who's coming to work and he's on his way to work. He may be a few minutes late and you flag him down and you say, well, you can't go this way. The bridge is out. He says, get out of my way. I, you can't tell me what to do. Who are you to impose your authority on me? And he goes in that direction. We understand the most loving thing that I can do is to try to do everything that I can, even if he doesn't appreciate it, to stop him from going across that bridge. Because that bridge is certain doom because the bridge has been washed out. And so the same is true with this. And I warn people and I share with them, this is what God thinks. They say, well, who are you to tell me and to pose your religious on me? I'm somebody who loves and cares for you. And because I want the best for you, I'm trying to reveal the best way for you. They may not affirm and accept that, but we understand that we're doing it out of love. We're doing it for the Lord. Uh, He knows our motives. We need to understand that. We need to understand this, that there is hope in Jesus Christ. People who struggle with same-sex attraction, as we look at 1 Corinthians 9, verse 11, can realize this, that there is forgiveness and new life available in Jesus Christ. And it's not just for same-sex attractive people. It's for all of us. All of us need that. All of us are sinners. That's what Romans chapter 3 reveals. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous. No, not one. Every one of us need to come to that realization that I can't get to God on my own, that I can't experience righteousness on my own, that I need help. And that help is available in Jesus Christ. And it doesn't exclude homosexuals. It's not like everybody except homosexuals can experience forgiveness in Jesus Christ. No, that is available for all people. But the good news of the gospel is this, that not only does Jesus Christ forgive us of our sin, he also gives us a changed heart and a changed nature. That righteous standard that is impossible for us to do on our own, 
He gives us the strength and the ability to do. Yes. He changes us from the inside. That's what Ezekiel reveals. He takes out our old stunning heart and he gives us a new heart of flesh that he puts his law inside of our heart. So it's no longer an external rule that I, I'm wrestling against. It now becomes an internal desire that I want to do. That God begins to change our nature. And what we begin to see is that our identity is not centered in our sexuality. Our identity is centered in Jesus Christ of who he is. And what he's done for us and what he equips and enables us to do. There is hope for those who want help and want hope. And it's in the person of Jesus Christ. We point people to Jesus Christ. There is hope in Jesus Christ. And so I want to challenge you and leave you with this challenge of two things. Number one is this. I want to challenge you to faithfully stand on the word of God. To faithfully stand with Jesus Christ. And still love your friends and family who struggle with same-sex attraction. It's not that I'm either going to stand with Jesus Christ or I'm going to love my friends and family. No, I faithfully stand and I hold to the standards of the Word of God. And I'm not going to compromise this just because everyone around us is changing. And sad to say, even sometimes, even some within the church are changing. I'm going to hold to what the Word of God clearly teaches. Amen. And as I live that out, I'm going to love my friends and my families and my neighbors that are struggling with same-sex attraction. And I'm going to love them through as Jesus Christ gives me. It, it's going to take some wisdom to do so. How that handles, I, uh, you know, you're going to have to seek some wisdom from God or from the Holy Spirit. It's how do I do that exactly? It, I want to ask you to commit to be faithful to Jesus Christ. Number two, I want to encourage you to point people to Jesus Christ as the power to forgive and to give a new identity. The answer is Jesus Christ. And he's the one who can give us a change. And he changes us from the inside out. And it's not just homosexuals that need this. All of us need this. Amen. Every person here today needs this truth. We need the change that Jesus Christ brings. That he has the power to forgive sin. And the power to give us a new identity in him. Let's bow our heads in order of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the hope and the help that is found in Jesus Christ. God, we pray that you would help us to be lighthouses of love and compassion for those that are struggling under the weight of sin. Even as a world seeks to define a new morality, they come away with the guilt and the stain of sin and no reason to define it. And yet they still struggle under that heaviness. God, help us to point people to Jesus Christ and to realize there is rest in Jesus Christ. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. And God, that is our desperate need of the day and of the hour. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand and sing a song of invitation there this morning. And that song of invitation there is number 433, I Surrender All. As we sing that song this morning, I pray that you would sing that as a prayer. Sure. Uh, that it's not just our goods and our desires, but it's even our sexual attraction that we surrender to Jesus Christ. And we can say, I surrender all. Let's stand together and sing. If God's moving and working in your heart, you come this morning. I surrender all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily. sing that song, I pray that that is our prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you for who you are, and we thank you for what you've done for us. God, that you went to the cross to redeem us from our sin. 
we are all guilty before God. And God, we like to measure sins and categorize some as acceptable and some as not. But God, all are sin before you and all place us under the wrath of God. So God, we pray that you would draw us to yourself, convict us of your sin, reveal Jesus Christ and his goodness to us, and give us the faith to believe and to receive the salvation that he freely provides. God, help us to surrender all to you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. You take your seats for just a moment here this morning. Let me just share quickly with you what's going on here this week as we look at this. We are are grateful for your faithfulness and for your giving, and, and the Amen. giving options are available there, the, the box as well as the online option, so we are grateful for your faithfulness there with that. Uh, ladies Missionary is having a yard sale there on June 4th, and so if you have some really good stuff around your house that you would like to get rid of and lighten your house a little bit, you can donate it to them, and then all of the proceeds of that sale uh, go to help to uh, fulfill their ministry as they... Uh, support missions, and they kind of show the love of Christ there throughout the area. And so uh, that is an opportunity there for that. June 4th, we're beginning to accept donations now, so you can just bring those to the church, and they will have that. And then uh, June 4th, make sure you show up there for the sale. Teens are having an activity uh, May 24th, a spring meal trip. And so if you have a teenager there from uh, 7th or 12th grade, talk to Pastor Brian, and he will give you the information there with that. And then May 29th, every fifth Sunday, in the evening, we like to do something a little bit different. And so we want to invite you to come out to uh, a movie there, uh, May 29th at 6 p.m. We will be showing the movie Overcomer. And, and uh, this is an encouraging and inspiring movie that will help to encourage you to continue to faithfully follow Jesus Christ. And we want to encourage you to come out uh, and to be a part of that there that evening. No cost for the event. You just come and have a night of fellowship and a good time there together with that. So we want to invite you to come and to be a part of that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 is our blessing that we'll end with today. And it says this, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. May God bless you today. You are dismissed today.